Welcome everybody to our series, You and Spirituality, with a very special guest, Emma Slade. We are deeply honored to be able to share this space with you, Emma. Emma was born in Kent and was educated at Cambridge University and the University of London, where she gained a first class degree. She's a qualified chartered financial analyst and worked in fund management in London, New York and Hong Kong. A deep-seated desire to inquire into the deeper aspects of humanity arose following a life-changing business trip to Jakarta, where she was held hostage at gunpoint. She resigned from her financial career and exploring yoga and meditation and methods of well-being with the ultimate aim of turning a traumatic episode into wisdom and conditions for thriving. She qualified as a British Wheel of Yoga teacher in 2003 and over the last 19 years has run numerous yoga workshops and retreats. Her interest in Buddhism as a science of the mind strengthened after meeting a Buddhist Lama on her first visit to Bhutan in 2011. This crucial chance meeting led to her studying Buddhism with this Lama and eventually led her uh, becoming the first and only Western woman to be ordained in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan as a Buddhist nun. She was named Ani Pema Deki, which means Blissful Lotus, a title she is doing her best to live up to. In 2015, Emma founded and became CEO of the registered UK charity Opening Your Heart to Bhutan to help special needs children in Bhutan. She continues to travel to Bhutan to manage the charity's projects and her Buddhist studies. In 2017, Emma was given the Point of Light Award by the UK Prime Minister in recognition of her exceptional volunteering. Her first book, Set Free, was published in April 2017, detailing her inspirational story. She has donated proceeds of the book sales to the charity. Her story was chosen by KLM to be featured on their flights globally, and her TEDx talk has been seen by over 300,000 people. Mm -hmm. I have seen it as well, so I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> She's a regular keynote speaker and has been widely featured in national and international media. In her role as a coach, she supports clients in areas including mental resilience, defining purpose, and leading with integrity. Over mm -hmm. the last 20 years, her spiritual training has honed Emma's ability to listen to clients profoundly without limits. Clients comment on how her non-judgmental presence allows them to gain clarity quickly. In her own words, open quotes, I believe in the transformative power of profound human connection and the joy of living with integrity and purpose. I feel my experience of East and West, of corporate and spiritual, allows me to offer something unique to others. Close quotes. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for being here with us today. I'll start at the very, very start. Um, or maybe not. I'll start at the very, like, current, basically. That mm. would be interesting. That's nice, yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me, so I have heard, now I am not as learned as you are, but I have heard of these various Buddhist, uh, Buddhism practices, various kinds. Mm. So which is this kind that you are in? And how is it, and what is this work that you do with the charity? What, what made you create this charity in the first place? Oh, okay. So both very long answers. I'll try not to go for too no, long. Yeah. Yeah. So as you um, so kindly said, uh, yeah, I train under the teachers in Bhutan and that's called Vajrayana Buddhism. So the, uh, in the Sanskrit term, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, that's part of Mahayana Buddhism, which is the wide vehicle. It's considered the wide path or the wide motivation. What does that mean? That means that when we practice, we don't practice simply for ourselves. We practice wholeheartedly with the um, really strong desire to bring all sentient beings with us as we practice to do our very best to free them also from the confusion and suffering if they're experiencing it 
so that's why it's this maha you know from sanskrit it's great like mahatma gandhi is a maha isn't it and so this great path is a wide path and so that's the form of my um just practice in terms of uh what i do uh, and there's many type texts to study and there's many uh, meditation practices to do to uh, develop the inherent seed which we would from a buddhist perspective called your buddha nature so inherent to each sentient being the understanding that there is an essence of unblemished kindness and wisdom particularly um perfect but it needs to be cultivated so the practices that we do to free us from the things which stop that coming into fruition so um, maybe you can say there's greed and there's anger but the root um, the thing that keeps us trapped is this clinging to a self and placing the self above others or in the center of the universe in a conceptual way. Always, always, always think about myself, let's think about myself. And uh, so the practices are ultimately designed to free us from that way of thinking so that we can be free and our capacity to help others can be boundless. So that's that, it's a big subject. <laughs> you might well have other questions about it. <laughs> Um, I would say that as you, uh, you know, if you mentioned my TEDx talk and you played the mantra of compassion at the beginning before we began on Mani Femi Hong, I think you know that um, he, from my personal experience of trauma, uh, the most profound change for me was the feeling of compassion which came, and which really took me by surprise because I didn't really value and I certainly didn't think that I was a particularly compassionate person. I thought maybe somebody else is doing that somewhere else in the world. Wow. And so um, I think that the incident in Jakarta showed me a feeling of profound compassion which I did not have any experience of before. And uh, that really was such a huge impetus to my spiritual inquiry and then in the beginning part of becoming a buddhist because i formally became a buddhist um, about uh 19 years ago and the thing that led me into that as well was hearing the chant of om mani padme hum and so this compassion this interest in compassion the sound of it power of it what is it how do you how do you do this thing uh was a very great interest to me and before I did the Indra practices, the 440,000 preliminary practices, my Lama had a really, we had concentrated a lot on my study and practice of compassion. In the end, I think then led to me feeling force that I wanted to do something about that in the world. I decided to um, do charity in 2015. I know you gave me the very swanky type of CEO. <laughs> it's very important uh, for people to realize that I don't receive any payment for the charity. In fact, I pay the expenses largely myself um, if I go to Bhutan for the charity or anything. So although I have that swanky title, it's, um, it's just a... Um, there's nothing swanky. There's nothing swanky about it. <laughs> So it was also very important to me that charity was really run as much as possible from the heart. That's why it's called opening your heart to be done. And that um, it's as effective but uncorporate as possible. You see what I mean? Yeah. That, that, that's very beautifully put. And would you say that... Um, so this this question that i wanted to ask was like why bhutan in particular oh i don't think in maybe bhutan right i mean in the end it definitely has been bhutan but i had a great interest in bhutan for 
long time as many people do i find bhutan is for many people something that draws their interest mm. or they think oh you know i'd quite like to i feel there's something there for me you know but the thing which obviously drew me back so quickly again and again was to be with the lama that i had met who i knew was my teacher and mm -hmm. he clearly knew that i was his student it was that connection between the teacher and the student if that connection if i had met lama in thailand i would be in thailand if i had met him in you know it'd be a lot easier if i'd met him in like you know i don't know bromley that would have been a lot easier <laughs> <laughs> Lots of blood and meeting him in John Shala and Bhutan at 3,000 meters, but never mind. Uh, it was the power of meeting the teacher, and that uh, was the thing that brought me back. I, I mean, I just absolutely adore being in Bhutan. I feel highly connected to the place, but the most important connection was with the teacher, and he happened to be there. And how did you, it's, I read in your bio, it says it was a chance meeting. So, how did this meeting happen? Oh, it's a very beautifully, if you haven't written the book, I think you should read the book because it's very beautifully described there, I think, you know. Um, it, it, yeah, it was like something really magical. Um, so we've been in Bhutan for a few days and you know, at that point, I'm already a Buddhist, right? So I'm already got some idea of um, I've done quite a lot of study of compassion and, and of compassion, but I, there's many things I don't understand. You know, I'm quite an inquiring person. So, you know, already on this trip, you know, whichever temple we go into, I always try to ask a question to some monk or you know, So the group's used to that. You know, I'm like, oh, I see something broke, so he's bound to go and ask them a question. Because this is my chance. You know, I'm born in England. I didn't have the chance to hang out with llamas and Yes. Meditators who have been meditating for years, right? This is like a dream of mine. I mean, you know, it's like the minute I see one of them, I'm like, oh, let's go and ask him a question, you know. So they're kind of used to it. But when I walked into the temple at Dochila, which is in a very high pass between Timpu and Punaka, you know, I saw this monk standing over there in that corner, solid. Me, very shining. It was this, I'm so crazy. There's no alcohol involved in the story, okay? I just want to, there's no need for a big health warning. I really felt as if I saw around his head some shining light, you know. You know. Then I noticed he had no socks on. It was freezing. You were at 3,000 meters in the Himalayas, right? There's no heating. It was freezing, right? So I'm like, oh, that's an interesting combination. You know, he's like, be freezing cold but he's shining on his head what's what's going on then what happened is that i went over to talk to him as i've done to many people in Bhutan, monks you know etc etc and the minute that he spoke whew, what was that i i just to hear his voice was and you know then we i just didn't want to stop hearing the voice that i heard and then we sat down and, you know, we're talking, sitting on the floor. We're talking about, I'm like, I'm going to get as much out of this meeting as I possibly can, you know? So I'm like grilling him, <laughs> passion, this, that. I just didn't want to stop talking, right? And somehow in the middle of it, I realized just how emotional this moment was, how very profound it was. I kind of switched from asking lots of questions to just realizing that in my heart something really profound was happening here. Mm. As, I, as, I said, as I said in the book, I said, I don't know why I said it, and I can't even quite remember the context, but I said to this the monk in Bhutan that I didn't know was a lama, I'd only just met, I said, I want a really kind person. Never said that to anybody in my life. And here I found myself saying, and it felt like the most truest thing I'd ever said. And I started to cry. Mm. And all the group left me. They left me. The rest of the group, they just abandoned me there, right? 
So I stumbled out this tumble at this temple, you know, still looking like a normal person at this gate. You know, I've got hair, I've got jeans on, you know, I'm kind of like vaguely crying, you know. I'm standing at the top of a mountain in, you know, in Bhutan. My group has left me. I'm completely like discombobulated, you know. And uh, yeah, and that was that. And it really was a life-changing meeting for me. But the irony was, I didn't realize at the time that Lama had just taken that post. So the monk I met, met obviously in the end, <laughs> turned out to be my Lama, but he had only just taken that post. He'd been there for four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. So if I had gone to Bhutan any time before, I guess actually I wouldn't have met him. No. So it's, the, it's, the, it's that timing, right? Of the thing that it yeah. happened. So, so uh, compassion, you talk very highly of compassion and you you said like at one point you didn't feel you you knew what compassion was it was some, for somebody else and not you but today after these years of training and all this work that you've done how do you define compassion hmm. yeah i made a small progress let's not get too overexcited <laughs> um So compassion, the development of compassion is very close to the um, freeing of yourself from selfishness, but it's not exactly the same thing I've discovered. So in the Buddhist teachings, we have compassion and we have wisdom. And we need both of them. Yeah. And if you've studied any Buddhism, you'll have an idea of what that wisdom uh, component is. Uh, okay. Passion, I think, from my experience, uh, is most powerful when it comes really when your heart has moved, when you have connected to something, some uh, situation of suffering, and your heart is so moved, you are changed. You say something you didn't think you were going to do say you do something you didn't think you were possible of doing think in a way you didn't imagine you could before this is really a strong compassion it's different from feeling sympathetic or, or to shame it's a feeling where your heart has been moved where it must help that's the feeling So there is an awareness that your own thing has been affected. I think sometimes with compassion, we think it's all about other people, right? Yeah. yeah. I think when, yeah. when compassion is powerful, you also have the awareness that something has changed in me. Some part of me yeah. is, you know, like there that I didn't know about before. So then there's a looking out and a looking in all at, all at the same time. Yeah. 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 And the question is, will you continue? <laughs> I think I think you will. I, I don't see you sort of stuff. Well, me, I think I'm okay. But, I, you know, for everybody else, I don't know. But then there will be challenges. There will be definitely challenges where you will think, uh, give up, or it's not worth it. Some other feelings come. Um, Sometimes when people help others, they feel cross that they didn't get helped in return. They feel they were grateful enough. So little obstacles will come that you'll have to um, tackle. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It seems hard. It's not, it's not that easy. But uh, yeah, it sounds, it's easy as a word. But, but <laughs> you know, it takes lifetime of, <laughs> of and births and like millions of you know a work to, to to get even to the sea of it um you know you're like you're like my twin right because <laughs> if you look at the back of the book in the back of the book there's two pages and it's called uh, what did i call it i called it something like um uh, i don't know practical advice for living every day or something i can't remember what i put it now and it's about 12 sentences from my lama directly from my lama from the teachings that he gave me right and the last one is if it was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. 
you know, and but you're like my twin because when I was taking the Nungjo teachings, and they're quite tough, you know, you do 110,000 prostrations, you do 110,000 Vajrasattva, you do, you know, endless, endless, endless. There's four lots of 110,000 practices, right? And you just can't help asking your teacher. As you get near the end of one of these practices, yeah. if the next one will be easier, yeah. you know. Yeah. So every time I got near the end of one of the practices, like, oh, Lama, is, is the Vajrasattva going to be easier than, than this? And he just used to, you know, find this completely perplexing that there was this very strong human wish to make the next thing a lot easier. Yeah. And uh, it's taken me a long time to not have that feeling of, oh, why isn't it easier? Or can't it be easier than this? You know? <laughs> so I totally, I totally understand where you're coming from there. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, easy hard you know we can be a bit zen about it it's yeah. just as it is you know you just have to get, yeah just have to get the work done so tell us more about this charity you said it's a charity for the special needs kids in Bhutan. so what exactly does the charity do and what is the work that you're involved in uh, so we do uh, quite a few things far more than i ever imagined to be honest you know we've helped to build I would say about 75% of the first purpose-built special needs school in Bhutan which is in Kanglung, Tashigang in the east of Bhutan and that has about 75 children in it. I think if you look on the charity website you'll see uh, the scale of what we've been involved in there. It's actually quite a huge undertaking yeah. involving many buildings and wheelchair access and um, toilets and ovens and laundry bits and all kinds of stuff you'll see there yeah. we've provided a number of vehicles for uh, schools where there are special needs children or children in difficulty yeah. um, we support blind uh, children and young adults training to be blind, uh, blind music teachers so they're blind musicians but they can become music teachers yeah. We help with a halfway home for children who have come from difficult backgrounds. Maybe their families are experiencing some breakdown or some uh, alcohol problem, something like that. Yeah. And so uh, we have helped them. Um, we have uh, built two dedicated play parks for in schools. Currently, we're putting five uh, clean water filter systems into schools in rural Bhutan. Um, we've done some work on prosthetic limbs for children who have lost their limbs and also training somebody more highly in that area. We've trained two special needs teachers, uh, so we've supported their training, not only those two, some other ones. Um, what else have we done? We've done a you know, fetal heart monitor for the Tashkang Hospital to try and help uh, women so that there's less chance of these you know difficulties um yeah that's a few things i forget now it's it's a lot <laughs> it's just a lot <laughs> it seems to be just a lot and uh yeah so that's my particular area of interest i suppose is um children who have had particular difficult path often it's quite hard for them to advocate for themselves mm. so they that's um that's something that i'm aware of that both they're in a state of difficulty but also sometimes that difficulty is not so visible or is not so spoken of or is hard to advocate about so um oh socks is deciding <laughs> that he's heard it all before yeah he's so over <laughs> compassion he's gone there we go. Uh, and yeah, so I quite, um, I think that's, that's important to me, not only that there was a need, but there was a need that was maybe harder to speak about on some level. Mm -hmm. I've shared the link of your charity on the chat so that everybody who's on this call today can see and I'll also post that up for the work. Um, coming to this, um, your, so what is your daily routine like, Emma? 
because I know you come from a, a financial background where I can imagine the daily routine being a CFA. I know what that was like, <laughs> but what is it now? Oh, really? There's not a, um, you can't really say that I have a strong daily routine at the moment because um, I am doing many things. Yeah. So uh, always your day will start with doing some work offerings on uh, on my shrine, prayers for people who have for prayers, etc. The day will end with so that'll be the, the start and the end. In the middle, these things could happen. So I am. Um, The, the thing for me is to balance the continuing study of Buddhism mm. and the um, Mahamudra meditation practices, which I have to undertake, with my work helping other people and being in the world. You know what I mean? Mm. So there's two components there. Sometimes, um, you know, I have to really block out time and say, mm not available <laughs> i am just practicing now uh, uh because otherwise um it can be quite difficult to balance. to balance it all my day will usually have a component of charity of some kind um talking and helping somebody of some kind whether it's coaching or just advising or we want to talk to me whatever some kind of element connected to teaching and an element of practice Mm. Anything else like eating or uh, the stuff, pretty minimal. I mean, obviously I eat, but I mean the stuff that takes up a lot of other people's lives will be pretty minimal in my life. Mm. Um, so practical stuff, I try to get down to the smallest component possible, mm. you know. Mm. Um, I don't know if that gives you a good enough idea. Do you have any other yes. question about that? I mean, pretty much I live, I live a life like that, but then I have a day job as well, which is not, which is not the, my day job is, is another job with numbers. So I have to, Oh, okay. that takes up a lot of my time. So that is that chunk of that practical work, which I have to do. So, so that takes up a lot of time. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think I've obviously, I'm really, really lucky. That it's nice about my life is all the components of my life help each other. Yes. They all feed into each other. They're kind of a reflection of each other. And I realize I'm really lucky to have that life. Yes. yes. But it's, um, I'm pretty sure it's never, it's not been like this at the start. Now it's come together, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now it's come together and it's quite um, Formula One speed also. I mean, it's quite, as I say, I couldn't find the link this morning because there's quite a lot of other links <laughs> to, to go through, etc. So So um, luckily I've got a lot of energy. Yeah. People are very surprised by my level of energy, I think. And I think you do need quite a lot of energy if you're going to have these quite a few different facets mm. going all at once, yes. you know, yeah. and maintain your sense of humor. Yes, very important it's, because because that's <laughs> the easiest, easiest. I think that's the only thing that keeps you. I mean, for me, I, I can't say for anyone, but for me, it's the only thing that keeps me alive. It's like laughing at all the things that I've done. It's like, how did I even do that? And did I really do that? So yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, from a uh, from my point of view, sense of humor very important. Most important to find the teacher, mm. to have the teacher. Mm. Absolutely have the connection with the teacher. So how now, now, that, now that otherwise very difficult, you know, yeah. To dedicate your way. Now that with COVID, you, I'm, I'm assuming you cannot travel as much as you would have loved to. I can see that expression on your face. So mm -hmm. how is it, uh, how do you keep in touch with the Lama in Bhutan, your teacher? Okay, so yeah, no, definitely this is the longest time that I haven't been in Bhutan for whatever, a decade. <sighs> Uh, so that's yeah I'm the minute the board is open I'm there I'm at the airport I'm knocking on the door I don't uh, uh, no with my so I have a um, I have a Lopen who teaches me the Shedra Buddhist philosophy there's a series of texts you have to study it's actually quite organized you know this and this and this and this and this 
and um, he's very excellent and he's pretty fluent in English. And we do the two translations that I've helped on from Tibetan to English, um, we work together on them. So he's very brilliant at English, but that's so lucky for me. And he's uh, on the Facebook, so I can Facebook message him. We talk a lot on Facebook because I'm forever got questions about these things. You know? And so I'm doing, uh, I'm doing a number of essays at the moment to show my understanding of the text. So I can email him the correct essay, then I can email it to him. Uh, with questions and then he will come back and say okay you haven't understood this or this etc etc et my meditation teacher who's uh his holiness uh, he is very um weird. uh i wouldn't imagine that who goes on facebook uh if he does email he won't do it himself somebody else will do it for him and so for me at this point it's not possible to be my meditation teacher um, but I have a lot of instruction from him, so I have to use this time well, so that when I meet him next, I've made a lot of progress. So him, it's not possible for me to talk to about my Lopen studies, I can talk to very easily. So thank goodness for, I mean, while I hate all the kind of, you know, email, Facebook, blah, to be honest, um, I'm very grateful for it at the moment. Um, and when you sort of like, so you, I know that there is this, there was this life and then there was this incident and then it was a change and the shift in your life and today you are where you are. So it was kind of like, if you look at it as a line, there was this bumpy thing in between an incident and then it was a shift. So today, if you look at your own life uh, from, you know, from being this high flying uh, financial with this high flying financial career, is there anything that you miss or is there anything that you're very happy that it's not there today? Oh, I mean, my life is, wow, look at my life. Crazy great is my life. What a chance. Yes. How, how did a girl in Whitstable get to be taught by Open Kinzang on some amazing Tibetan text? Just, he sits in Bhutan. I mean, how, how can you, you can't even make that stuff up. What, what to miss? And is there something that you, you feel that it would, so do you think now when you look back that probably it was all in, uh, was meant to happen? It was just that timing of it? Or how, how do you see it? I mean, I think that um, the, my interest in Buddhism and meditation was actually very strong right from the beginning to be honest even as a child so i think there was an underlying um density as they would say in, uh, in Pakistan. um i think there was underlying thing there you know i think it the jakarta incident to really um bring it to the fore a little bit like okay come on you know this is the real deal about your life will you sort it out now please yeah. like that. that was the result of it you know mm. i mean the incident in jakarta you, know, you have to wonder where where did that come from because it just seemed to feel like it came out of the blue um to me it was so unexpected because it, it's turned out to be Such a life, positively life-changing thing for me. You know, you've got to wonder where, what is, what is that about? Something that appeared, and did feel obviously incredibly terrifying at the time. In the end, it really saved my life from a life which would have been um, far less fulfilling, which would have only really touched parts of me. Whereas my life now. I feel like the whole of me is there, my heart and soul, my intelligence, so that it can help others with charity, etc. Um, it's just like all of me has come alive. In the financial world, it was fine, and I really enjoyed it on some level. And intellectually, it was very satisfying. But my, you know, my heart and soul wasn't there. It was like being only half alive. 
totally understand that totally i can i can see romella smiling romella is uh, is a friend of mine and she also she's been part of the from the very start um <laughs> and she's a practicing buddhist herself so she does oh, okay. and meditation so i'm pretty sure she has some questions that she wants to ask you so romella over to you hi emma i'm nice to meet you i'm literally in trance whatever you said i mean kind of matched so many things the first one being Bhutan. um i travel uh, i like traveling but for a lot of reason i'm not traveling at the moment and yeah. at 18 i went to Bhutan with my parents and until today when somebody asks all the places you have been to where do you want to go again and without a doubt i say Bhutan because i remember <coughs> from him put a faro in a car and the car stopped uh, somewhere just for a tea or coffee or for a new break and I looked at that place so it was just like a greeting card like the road the pebbles the streams and the mountains and you took me back there and then your chanting I was hearing our chanting is numb your heart and get here so I, oh, yeah. I dedicate my life to the law of cause and effect with my voice and when I heard that chanting I was I, 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 I don't even know what to speak or how to speak but one question i have out of interest like you can see my butsudan and inside that is my gohanzun i'm not allowed to show my gohanzun in the camera so it's the chinese okay. Japanese script in front of which i chant so when you said um your shrine or your altar what do you chant in front of is it empty or do you chant in front of something so you can um usually i sit for these talks i sit in front of my shrine but i was giving myself like it's a uh, kind of a relaxing start to my day because i couldn't find the email address so you can see my shrine is here right uh, can, yeah. just very simple shrine there's my teacher at the end mm -mm. yeah here's, here's my teacher and here's generally my big teacher yeah Thank uh, you. so it's just a very simple shrine uh used to have a more complicated shrine um, and that's quite common in Bhutan. I think you'll have noticed in Bhutan when you go to a shrine in Bhutan, it, it'll be like um, a bring and buy sale. Everything will be on it. Every teacher you ever met, every flower, every packet of crisps, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I had a shrine a bit more like that at one point with, you know, lots of, lots of teachers. And then I just really simplified it actually, to be honest. And um, so because in the, actually right from the beginning but later on in practice your from a vajrayana point of view i don't know how it is in your tradition from a vajrayana point of view um the relationship with the teacher is very very important and in a way your meditation is none other than an offering to your teacher it is a symbol of your connection to a teacher a great teacher right their what they embody and so um because i always would have a picture of my teacher on the shrine particularly if i'm doing those meditation practices and i would very much directly sit as if he's there in front of me in terms of and connecting to him because in the vajrana way that's very very important thank you Another question, my second question is, when you were mentioning about compassion, uh, mm. I mean, as I learned in my uh, practice that forgiving myself for the, um, I wouldn't call it stupid anymore because every everything I did uh, taught me something. Uh, I stopped she said the same thing. So when you started this journey of compassion, I know the three pillars of uh, its courage, compassion, and wisdom. And uh, like in, in your journey of compassion, how how quickly or how difficult or how easy it was to be compassionate to yourself this is my first question and the second one of wisdom and taking from you what you said sometimes compassion is even difficult when you're compassionate to someone else they they drain you out because they think you can give so they just try to like um draw everything out of you but in return you don't get anything so using your wisdom 
do you then say, okay, here I have to stop because I need compassion for myself as well? Is it the same kind of practice you do as well? Like when in your journey of compassion, like for yourself as well as others? Okay, I might have lost that a bit, but let me try, okay? So when we talk about this from a Buddhist point of view, uh, certainly from a practitioner's point of view, the passion to the self is to free the self from suffering. Suffering uh, mainly in the form of greed, anger, and self pain right? That's what, from a practitioner's point of view, that's what passion towards your own being means. That's the job. So it may have a different feeling from more relative world idea of self-care or something like that. So sometimes we need to um, be easy with ourselves, be comfortable with ourselves, go on a walk, uh, see a friend, feel the door. Oh, that's a new student. Just kidding. Um, uh, sorry, I got distracted. Um, yeah, so sometimes we need to do these very easy things, which are just about uh, releasing ourselves from a relative world anxious state. So we remember calm, we can be kind, etc. Like a um, day to day tuning up. Yeah? Ultimately, the job of the practitioner, when we talk about compassion for themselves, is to free themselves from the things which cause suffering. And the things which cause suffering in uh, Buddhism are the three poisons of the mind, you know, greed, anger, and selfishness, which means that one hasn't understood the nature of reality, one hasn't understood impermanence, hasn't understood the nature of non-self. That's the job of a practitioner. So, you know, as a Western, in the West, people are very anxious, um, very highly stressed, or oh, socks is back. Socks. <laughs> Fox has no anxiety whatsoever. You're like, and I mean, often it's very useful. Look at an animal if you want to realize what it was like to be in the moment anxious. Just observe a dog or a cat. That is very helpful. But so in our daily lives, we need to be we need to be knowing how to how to take ourselves out of an anxious state to uh, realize we are calm, capable of kindness. We are very precious. Etc. 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 Right on a day-to-day -day kind of adjustment level, mm. we have to have in our toolbox. We have to know what's the best way for us to free ourselves of daily anxiety. Yeah, day-to-day -day level. But on an ultimate level, the job of a practitioner is you want to be uh, passionate towards your own being, just to free that being from suffering. It's the part of a practitioner. So. You know, I have a kind of non-Buddhist answer and a Buddhist answer there, or, you know, so, yeah, does that make sense? It makes sense, but what I'm trying to get to the point is, um, uh, you said something like in the lines of being compassionate when you give, sometimes you feel you're mm. not getting the support you get in return. So mm. when something of that sort happened to you because you you mm. are in a journey of giver now so you also mm. mentioned every day you try to uh, give something to someone or support someone or teach mm. someone mm. we have something called the uh, I, I love my numbers so i'm another number loving person we have a something called zero one two three so which is zero complaint one hour of chanting 20 minutes study and make three people happy and i only say within that three people, one has to be me. Because if I'm not filling my cup, I cannot give up. So when you are helping somebody, when you're teaching somebody out of your compassion, and uh, I know in the Buddhist uh, realm, uh, over a prolonged period of practice, you try to detach yourself that what I'm getting in return, because you turn the table and you see, even by giving, you're transforming something inside. But when the recipient is just taking and taking and taking, you're not expecting something return like, okay, everything I'm giving, I need a return. But you do understand that that other person is coming from a point of, okay, I only want to take. 
and using your wisdom, do you stop that and just say, okay, I am compassionate and I have to give, but I have to be wise as well that when to stop. Do you practice that self? I don't know whether it's self awareness or. Uh, okay. Yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> So, um, in fact, I, we, I discussed this with very, this very point with my Lopen recently. I was recently, and I was really surprised by his answer in a way. So I had often, strange enough, when you run a charity, running a charity gives you the opportunity to both understand the nature of suffering a little bit more, but also the nature of the mind which gives. Mm. And you'll see many different forms of, a giving mind some uh, what we would call very uh, pure some quite polluted uh, so I said to Lopin okay so we have somebody was asking me not to give to my charity they wanted to give to some other charity but they were worried that that charity wouldn't use the money very well and well some they had some kind of worry about it already they're worrying about it right yeah. and I wanted to ask Lopin, surely it's better for them to give anyway, because helping others is, you know, what we're about here. Come on, we're Buddhists, right? And, uh, and he said, no, if there's already worry or tension or resentment in the mind, no point to give. It's spoiled. And I thought that was really interesting. Because I think a lot of our giving is contaminated by some of these. Um, they're not the coarse forms of anger, but they're more subtle forms of anger, resentment, frustration, a little bit of anxiety, etc. So when, when we give to others, it's a chance for us to observe what is happening in our own mind. And there you can learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That shift, that entire shift then is not outside. It's a shift inside. And I always say that the work on the outside is actually a work on the inside. So the more you work on the inside, the more beautiful outside you're going to have <laughs> because it's a reflection of it. But, you know, we don't, uh, you know, I think that we have to be skillful, mm. you know, as well. If you feel that something is not something you wish to continue with, then just peacefully finish it there. Just and turn your attention somewhere else, you know. Yeah. So yeah. So you did question. use oh sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you, Emma. But I no, just no, it's fine, it's fine. one line that the peaceful detachment is also something that's important. Yeah. Uh so we must be a little bit careful with this word detachment. Your, um, it's one to explore. You know, your friend said detach from the self. You can't really detach from the self if the self has not really uh, <laughs> existed in the sense that you think about it in the first place, right? So then you go around a kind of philosophical, uh, you know, philosophical, um, philosophical loop. I think if we summarize it, firstly, our job is to uh, bear witness to the kind of human being that we are in the world, to recognize that, to see the strengths and the areas which are not so strong or maybe causing suffering to ourselves and others. Try and see a human being uh, with whichever name you have. Yeah. So there's not a detachment, but there's a kind of witnessing, honesty, and kindness. Yes. You know, here's this human, they're trying their best. Is they find this easier, they find it a little bit more difficult. First of all, the job is to make that human that shows up in the world as kind and wise yeah, as possible, right? Mm. Like a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah. First that, and other things. Yes. Yeah. That's very beautifully put. I think it will take me some time to actually imbibe that in, with, you know, that, that image. The way you were talking about it, I think it's, I, I could see the images, uh, and the, the observer and the one that's observing. So, that yeah, first that, then yeah. later other things, but first that, 
we couldn't get too confused about the different time. levels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have a I have a rather funny question to ask. And I, I am I hope I'm okay to ask this question. So my most funniest question to you, Emma, is when you were reading and studying, so which is the scripture that you found very easy and which is the scripture that you found really, really hard? I think to a certain extent, the actual, uh, the scriptures, the meditations, the prayers, all of them are not exactly hard, but they're all pretty deep and sophisticated. You may read the first layer and think, oh, okay, I get that. And as you continue in your own journey, you come back and say, oh, okay, now I get that. Okay, that means that and that. You know, or, you know, what are, oh, that's so clever. I didn't see that first time around, you know? So the, the text of Dharma, I like that. You know, they get richer and richer, actually, with your own understanding. Um, because a lot of my study has included looking at things in the a Tibetan, the Tibetan language. Whew, it's yeah. not been easy. <laughs> that has not been easy. And it continues to be uh, a big challenge for me. Uh, and I just have to kind of go, you know, slowly with it. <laughs> um, but when you're reading, a, like I'm reading the Ulama at the moment, which this text I'm studying is on the, um, what you can say, ultimate changeless nature of, of the sentient being, you can call it Buddha nature or true nature. You know, you, it's quite a big idea in the first place. And you're trying to wade through the Tibetan, understanding Tibetan. Then you're trying to translate the Tibetan back into English in your head. To try and, and at that stage, you need to lie down, you know? So the ideas are pretty intense. Then you've got the language issue. So um, I wouldn't call it difficult, but I would, you know, you need, you need to really want to learn it and you need to have a teacher that will stick by you. Mm. you know, because otherwise you would just think, oh, daytime telly is a lot more easy than this. And we're back to that question of what is easy again. Yes. Right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So in terms of easy, I think the Sanskrit mantras, which are, uh, an essential part of the Tibetan canon of study uh, are, you know, like Om Mani Padme Hum, or, you know, they are very, not easy exactly, but they have such a power to bring, uh, you know, they're like those, what are people eating now? Power balls or something. You know, where it's like the goodness of about a million things brought into a very small little round box. Mantras are, the mantras are like that, right? They are very, they're very helpful. They're not easy, but they're, they just have that extraordinary power to them. Mm. And how long did it take you to learn to study Tibetan, the language? Oh, <laughs> don't say, don't, don't act if I finish that. I am so not expert at this. Please don't put it in that category. You know, I have to sit there with the, you know, some sentence aside. It's painful. It's painful. You know, you just I have to go very slow. Okay, that means that. Let me just check that. Okay, that means that. Because I'm very bad with languages, and I it it yeah. it's like a very daunting feeling to me. You know, so I barely can manage to speak English, and I'm happy with that. So I can't really. Language center of my brain is not really very active, so I find it very very hard. Yeah, me too. Mine's useless. What to do? <laughs> Just what to do? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to give up? <laughs> this is this again. You see, you see, you have to uh, do. Ultimately, do I want to have studied this text? Do I want to feel I've understood it, so I don't make any mistakes? If other people ask me about it, I can share little bits with others. Yeah. So what to do yeah got to put that resilience one resilience <laughs> front and just keep on and do it and deliver <laughs> well i just realized we just passed an hour emma and thank you so oh, much for your gosh. time it's like we could just Dubai. yeah time just 
flows when you're having these deep conversations. And I hope uh, and wish you all the very best and all the work. Oh, thank you. Doing. And thank you very much for taking this time out to be with us. I know how busy you are. And with all these language things, I mean, I think I need a lot <laughs> after this. Because <laughs> that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. No problem. So it's very nice to meet you all. I hope it's a benefit this uh, talk and, uh, you know, maybe meet you again. You never know. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.